Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Ed Price. I am from Texas A&M. I am responsible for the Conflict and Development Lab at Texas A&M, funded by the U.S. Agency for International Development and other uh, collaborators, including the Howard G. Buffett Foundation. Glad to see you represented here today. Um, thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, we have wonderful colleagues who have uh, joined us to make this a uh, a wonderful occasion and a very productive occasion. Uh, I'm going to, in a moment, uh, come back to introducing the people who've helped to put this on and who our partners are. But first of all, I would like to ask to Cora Jones to give some introduction representing the Higher Education Solutions Network. Thank you, Ed. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is properly caffeinated. Because um, you are in for a treat um, this day. And first, I just want to welcome you on behalf of USAID. Um, my name, again, is Takora Jones. I'm the Senior Advisor in the Office of Science and Technology and the Program Director responsible for the entire Higher Education Solutions Network. And we are so proud that Texas A&M is one of our inaugural members. In November of 2012, we launched this network with the notion that we could bring together a new era in university engagement for USAID. We, as an agency, have had very strong partnership with the academic community for over over the 50 years that we've been established but we haven't yet we hadn't yet really been able to tap into and harness the creative the creativity of so many students who are so enthusiastic about international development and what we ended up doing after um, Alex ha and the administrator had been out on a number of visits to universities, Alex came back and said I've seen the I've seen the future and we're not in it and that then led us to, to rethink how we were partnering with universities. The Office, the Office of Science and Technology is a very new institution. It's only about um, three, three years old and only independent and directly reporting to our administrator as of November of last year. And, and within that role, we have really been able to um, jumpstart and catalyze new conversations with the academic community, with the scientific and technical communities, with our federal science agencies that have led us to build new partnerships partnerships and new bridges that um, allow us to be able to bring the passion, the enthusiasm, and the intellect of so many in this world to the problems of development, to problem solving and development. And so in terms of where Texas sits within this pantheon, there are seven um, leading institutions um, and kind of seven and a half development labs, but each one of them have partners around the world. You know, out of these seven, we have 100 partners. If I had a PowerPoint, I'd show you the great airport map that we have that shows all these linkages that you all already have that are so very exciting. But each one of these labs works in a broader innovation ecosystem to essentially create, test, and scale new approaches and, te and technologies for international development. Um, of these seven, um, they are, if I go west to east across the world, University of California, Berkeley, uh, Michigan State University, Texas A&M University, um, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the College of William and Mary, Duke University, and McCarroy University in Uganda. Each one of these partners brings together a wide array of um, institutional linkages on their campuses and with their partners. For example, Texas is, for the $6 million over five years that we are supplying Texas, they're bringing $15 million to the table. So this isn't just the typical kind of granting mechanism where we fund and kind of, you know, check in after about a year. This is much more um, about how we create a strong and collaborative partnership with a variety of universities around the world. And so what's been so heartening to see is the work that my colleague Michelle Larchevec has put in, wave, um, <clears throat> as, as one of my team members, she has put in considerable amount of work to make sure that we connect to um, USAID and that we find different ways to make sure that the work that you do has impact on development. And so, you know, this first day where you're covering human and institutional capital, we're really excited about the conversations that you're going to have. We're very excited, actually, to have your students joining us tomorrow. So I will be over there um, listening to the student presentations. But, you know, it, 
it, it is just a wonderful time to think about, in spite of all the sequestration going on, is a wonderful time to think about all of the impact that you as academics, you as students can have on international development. So I want to thank you for your time this morning. I want to thank you all as panelists for the conversations you're going to have. Thank you, Joe, for being such a wonderful collaborator as well. Mal Malcolm, I just saw you come in. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Ed, for your leadership, because um, with strong leadership and strong partnership, I think we will have the kinds of impacts that we're looking for in international development. So enjoy your day, engage in conversation, and um, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Michelle. And uh, <coughs> sorry, thank you, Takora. And I was going to thank Michelle. Thank you. Uh, I want to um, recognize the team that has stood with us and uh, has helped us so much in putting together this program and actually will see us through the five years of the first five years of this work. We have three people here from USAID. Joe is sitting in front of you, actually. Joe Hewitt is one of the, our three colleagues who's working closely with us. Malcolm Phelps just arrived from Afghanistan uh, not too long ago. Um, he works with education uh, in Afghanistan in the AFPAC Bureau. Michelle Darshvek is, Larshvek is our really strongest uh, leader here. She works with us on a daily basis. So she takes incredible notes. She keeps us straight and um, has such a wonderful judgment and such a wonderful expression and ability to synthesize what, uh, what we do. So actually, I'll have to say that our work is really not too great because Michelle is here. And when it's all over, she'll say, well, this is what was said, and this is what we did, what, uh, where we move from from here. But anyway, I just want to recognize that AID team for being so strong and helpful to us. Um, at Texas A&M, uh, we are a combination of three organizations, uh, the School of Rural Public Health, uh, we, uh, uh, and um, Rasul Ramji is here representing the School of Rural Public Health. The Bush School is our other partner. We have a very strong and large contingent from the Bush School. Let me ask uh, those, uh, is Dr. Sarami or other of the Bush School faculty here yet? Not quite yet? Okay. I'd like for the Bush School capstone course uh, uh, to stand up. We've, uh, these are the um, second year students completing their master's degree in the Bush School of Government and Public Service. This particular group has taken on the project for the last six months to guide us in their best thoughts about how to develop this program on conflict and development. They'll be assisting throughout and visiting with USAID while they're here. Thanks very much, guys. Guys and girls. <laughs> um, I also wanted to recognize the staff in our Office of Conflict and Development who've been so extremely important to this entire undertaking. Um, Caitlin Shaw is a graduate student. Stand up, Caitlin. Vince Partita, Jerry Kenny, Shariar, uh, Joey, he's with the camera there. These are our colleagues who are the, uh, and, Megan. oh, and Megan, sorry, Megan. Oh, there you are, Megan. You stand up. Uh, no, okay, great. <laughs> um, these are our colleagues who are the core team at Texas A&M uh, that are making this work. Um, now about our purpose. Uh, for the next three days, we will have a succession of three workshops. Today's workshop is on human capital and development. Our job is to listen to some of the best minds in development and conflict in the world who've come together to assist us in thinking about how human capital and institutional capital interact with conflict. Our job with USAID under our grant is to assist the agency in refining its policies and programs in order to better uh, impact conflict in a, in a favorable way. It is to reduce conflict, to, to avoid conflict, to assist communities in surviving conflict, and to assist communities to recover following conflict. Today, we're going to be looking specifically at human and institutional capital and how that relates to conflict. The end result of this is after three days of the first day on human and institutional capital, the second day tomorrow the workshop will be on natural resources and conflict. On the third day it will be science, technology, food security and conflict. At the end of that time, we will have identified what we regard as the key areas 
are the key drivers at conflict that we feel will, uh, that we will direct research uh, toward over the next five years. Um, the, so it's your job to help us find those issues. It's also your job to help us think about the best laboratories, the best places in the world to look at that. So today, I think our speakers, as well as our discussants, will be looking at the key issues and the key geographies that are related to conflict and development. And at the end of this time, at the end of the week, we, have, we hope we will have a prioritized what these issues are and these places are, such that that is where uh, our work will be taking place over the next several years. Um, uh, human capital, in my view, and I distribute it to others, but I'll, maybe uh, Joe may have, have a, a version of this as well, but human and institutional capital, on the human capital side includes gender, youth, uh, education, human health, migration, many other dimensions of the human side of, of the population and its interaction with conflict. Uh, on institutions, it's policy, traditions, laws, uh, customs, all of that relates to conflict as well. So those, that's the general framework or the general area of, of human capital and conflict. Uh, with that, um, are there any questions on the, uh, the general format for, the, for today? will be presenters for the first uh, session for uh, until about 10.30. And then uh, after a coffee break, we'll come back and have respondents for about uh, until 12.30. Um, early afternoon, uh, the, the uh, speakers and respondents will join with us for a period of synthesis for about an hour from two to three, just that group. And then later on in the day, then AID, a few staff, and we will get together to, to synthesize what we heard. Over the three days, there's gonna be a lot of overlap. So we won't decide everything today, but we expect to hear much of what we want to hear about human capital and development. So with that, uh, Joe, I'll appreciate your leading from here. Okay, great, thank you, Ed. I assume this is on. Good morning. Uh, my name is Joe Hewitt. I am with USAID in the Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation. Uh, and I'll be moderating the first panel. Uh, my job uh, is actually relatively easy. Uh, my job is simply to try to facilitate all of the good ideas that are gonna be coming from our panelists and get them out on the floor and then facilitate uh, a discussion that uh, uh, will, will really begin with our audience members, uh, reacting to what you've heard and putting more good ideas on the table. Uh, that's the purpose of today, is to get as many good ideas on the table as we can, uh, from which we'll sift and try to distill over the course of the day to try to provide uh, some guidance and some wisdom for uh, this great team that we have as they move forward in the months to come. Uh, the way we decided to frame this uh, is by posing a question to our panelists, who I'll introduce to you in a, in a, a brief moment. Uh, we posed a question to them that uh, discourages any equivocation. Uh, so it may have been a little painful, uh, but we asked them, what specific investment or policy intervention should the development community prioritize to prevent the outbreak of civil violence, support households and communities during conflict, and or accelerate post-conflict recovery? And so we made them uh, address a question that uh, asked them to sort of pick one. Uh, and none of them did that. Uh, they, they did equivocate a little bit because they're smart uh, and they know that there's, there's more than a magic bullet or a silver bullet that'll solve the problems of conflict and fragility. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I think we've succeeded in getting th uh, four great pr framing papers that have lots of great ideas about how we're gonna move forward. Uh, so each will give uh, about a 10 minute presentation. Uh, and let me, let me introduce them now uh, in alphabetical order. Uh, and that'll be the order we'll go through the papers. Uh, and then um, from there, we'll have a discussion. So let me start first with uh, immediately to my left. Uh, this is Jendai Frazier. Uh, Jendai Frazier is a distinguished public service professor at Carnegie Mellon University, where she's on the faculty at the Heinz College's School of Public Policy and Management and the Dietrich College's Department of Social and Decision Sciences. She's the director of the University Center for International Policy and Innovation. Uh, formerly, Ambassador Frazier served as the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State 
uh, for African Affairs and is a special assistant to the President and Senior Director for African Affairs at the National Security Council. We're really delighted to have you here. Thank you. Uh, uh, not here is Reiko Huang, who unfortunately uh, was not feeling well and was not able to travel. Uh, she's going to be broadcast live by Skype. Uh, Reiko Huang is an assistant professor in the master's program in international affairs at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M Texas University. Uh, she holds a PhD in political science from Columbia University and came to the Bush School from Stanford University, uh, where she was a Zuckerman Fellow at the Center for International Security and Cooperation. We're delighted to have her with us. Uh, I know she's not feeling well, so hopefully the technology will make up the difference. Uh, sitting to the left of uh, Ambassador Frazier is Claire Lockhart. Uh, she's the co-founder and director of the Institute for State Effectiveness, which focuses on development across the institutions of state, market, and civil society. ISE works with government and leaders across a range of countries, including Afghanistan, Kosovo, Nepal, Pakistan, Sierra Leone, Somalia, and Southern Sudan. So not particularly easy states to work in. Uh, she's the co-author of Fixing Failed States and author of several articles on development, institution building, and citizenship. She's frequently called upon to serve on advisory panels and task forces on security and economic issues, including the World Bank on its Fragile State Strategy and the United Nations Peace Building Commission and the UN Strategy for Development post-2015. Uh, finally, Klina. Uh, Raleigh is Professor of Political Geography at Trinity College in Dublin, where she engages in research on African politics, conflict patterns, the political consequences of climate change, and conflict analysis methodologies. She is the director of the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project. ACLID is the uh, acronym for that. She is also a contributing author to the African chapter of IPCC 2014 and the co-director of a new research center on complex emergencies at the University of Sussex, uh, where she will hold a chair in conflict geography as of September 2013. We're really pleased to have you here, Kleena. So with that, uh, I think it's time for me to stop talking uh, and to hand it over to Ambassador Frazier uh, to start us off. Uh, I will roughly keep time, and I might hold up two fingers when it's starting to get close, meaning it's okay. about two minutes, sure. okay? Thanks. Thank you very much, and a good morning to all of you. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I really want to thank the organizers for putting on this workshop and giving us an opportunity to brainstorm about such important issues as human and institutional capacity in development and conflict. I especially want to thank Takora Jones and Ed Price um, for the invitation to me um, and for all of the work that's gone into this morning. I know that there's a lot of work and all of you who participated in organizing this event. I'm going to, when I was asked the question about what intervention um, and what, what area or what region and which country, I, I think I w didn't equivocate. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was pretty clear. Um, and uh, specifically, I thought, if you're looking, uh, my expertise is in Africa, and if you're looking at conflict um, and development in Africa, the obvious choice uh, in terms of a place is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, this is a country that has tremendous impact across the continent with bordering nine different countries to the east, south, west, and north. And so it really is the heart of Africa and it has been plagued, as all of you know, by insecurity basically um, before its founding, um, before its independence in 1960. Um, it's had a long history, um, a long and devastating history of, of insecurity, conflict, instability. And I felt that uh, the key to really achieving greater stability in the Congo is institutional and human capacity. And I say that because I've been part, I've been working the Congo since, directly since 1998, 99, um, under the Clinton administration. 
when you look at um, you know movements towards having the Lusaka peace agreement, which brought UN peacekeepers into Eastern Congo to deal with the latest crisis, or at that time the latest crisis, which was the uh, post-genocide um, in Rwanda and all of the forces going into Eastern Congo, which continues to plague that country today. I um, mean, you go from 98 to the 2002 Sun City Accords, you know, GOMA agreement, uh, the agreement that led to CNDP uh, going into the government in 2009, all the way up to the latest agreements in 2013. So one thing that is for sure about Congo is it's not easy, but it, you're, it's, you're capable of coming up with peace agreements. But the challenge is to sustain those agreements. Each one of those agreements have since been broken. Um, some in some form or other. And so there is a tremendous need for a longer term institutional capability to achieve the national peace and regional stability. I think it's wrong to always talk about the challenges of conflict in Congo as Eastern. In fact, it's to the North, it's to the South, it's throughout the country. There is a tremendous need to advance national integration and reconciliation um, as part of the peace process, as well as to advance good governance and capacity for uh, ensuring uh, reforms, effective reforms for that good capacity. And then finally, to create an enabling environment for development to take place that benefits all Congolese. And so I saw those as really the three core goals or objectives, and the specific intervention um, I suggested was a Congo Institute of Peace or some type of Institute of Peace. And here, let me just explain my thinking. I was asked in, uh, this is 2013, so 2012, <laughs> uh, in the summer of 2012 or so, I was asked by President Kabila to come and talk to him about the latest crisis, which was the uh, M23 rebellion. Uh, and the reason is because on, on January 21st, 2009, when uh, President Obama was about to be sworn in and I was on a metro going to the inauguration, I got a call from President Kabila and President Kagame. And they both told me at that time that they were coming to an agreement to carry out joint operations against a genocide, the FDLR. Um, and that they were going to bring CNDP into um, the far DC, the Congolese army, to carry out these joint operations because it was considered a fairly effective rebel group. And so they had a new agreement in 2009. And I said to them, of course, at that time, just hold on, just hold on. A new team is about to be here. <laughs> you, know, you know, you can relay your, your, your message uh, at noon. Uh, when the president will be sworn in. This was very early in the morning at 7 a.m. And so fast forward in 2012, President Kabila is calling me saying, look, can you go talk to President Kagame? You know the background um, of our cooperation over these number of years, and now it's completely broken down. And, you know, the allegations about Rwandan support uh, for former CNDP now called M23. And I said, okay, fine. I went, I talked to President Kabila. Um, and what I was struck by, which is what brought me to this idea of this intervention, and I went to see him and President Kagame and then President Museveni several times after that, was that every time I met with President Kabila, I met with him alone. He was the only person in the room. Um, whenever I went to meet with President uh, Museveni or President Kagame, there were others who were taking notes, who were prepared to follow up with the discussion, um, who you could tell were part of the decision-making process. And, and I then went to President Kabila and I said, well, who's your team? You know, who is helping you, who is supporting you? And I met with other officials, uh, the foreign minister and others, but um, quite frankly, I felt that the president needed greater capacity to look at various options. Um, and that there, we, we needed an inter, and I, so I thought we need to build the capability not only of, you know, civil society, but even the state itself and the leadership, the decision making um, apparatus around the president. And so the idea here is really to improve governance um, or 
create greater institutional capacity for governance and the decision-making around options for peace by creating an institute that is semi-governmental and, and very much civilian, right? To bring civil society into the decision-making process and also take government officials and create greater transparency within their decision-making process by involving different voices and more voices from um, Congolese um, civil society. Here I worked very closely with a Reverend Malo Malu, who has been very much part of most of these peace agreements. Um, he also was the head of the Electoral Commission during the first and successful, very successful um, election. So the idea is to create this institute, which will generate policy ideas and option papers to inform government uh, decision making, particularly around peace and development. Um, also to create a forum for national and local dialogue to build sustainable foundations for Congolese peace and to establish civic, economic, and security training programs for both Congolese civilians and officials. The, how, would I, how, would, how do I suggest that we go about doing this? Um, there, I think of it in three parts. One is a policy planning research center, which is this semi-governmental institution that can generate innovative ideas and thought leadership um, in fields related to conflict resolution, development, and governance. And the idea would be to have it situated perhaps you know, in Kinshasa, I'm thinking very much in the capital, maybe at one of the universities, but it could also have reach into the government ministries, not only the Office of the Presidency, but also foreign affairs, justice, defense, rural development, gender and family affairs, and children. So in the relevant ministries have this link um, and have this uh, movement between civil society and government going back and forth, something that we take for granted uh, here in the United States. So it would, be a, it would be a new institutional policy and planning resource to support and augment government decision making. Secondly, I thought about as part of this Institute of Peace, a post-conflict development center that would focus on human capacity building through outreach, education, and training programs. And this would include um, conflict mediation, working with communities on entrepreneurship, dealing with government officials and the military on civil military relations, um, and so really doing sort of professional and vocational training programs to engage women, cooperatives, you know, the military, even, um, uh, even um, victims of war and those who have been demobilized, um, both from rebel groups and from the National Army. And then third, the third aspect was to document this and to, to, to harness the lessons learned from Congolese ex experts themselves. So assemble something of a research library and an information system or center that documents and publishes lessons learned on conflict resolution and peace building in the Congo and the Great Lakes region. Drawing especially on lex local expertise that generates knowledge and innovative approaches so that all of the ideas aren't coming from outside of Congo. There's a wealth of knowledge and experience and information that can be harnessed from within. Implementation, um, specifically some of the notional projects for implementation would be houses of peace. Now these houses of peace could be uh, located in neutral ground or they, could, they would create neutral ground to nurture communication and dialogue. Um, and prevent conflict over local issues. The idea of the Houses of Peace would be to place them in major cities in each of the provinces where there are multiple ethnic groups and the potential um, for um, local-based uh, conflict issues. Secondly, would to work with governors um, of the provinces on the cross-border networks because obviously the problems of Congo, particularly in the east, but not just in the east, are also shared with their neighbors. And so trying to build that, those communities and that work network across border, including uh, promoting economic development and cooperation. And then finally, what I said was the core, which is this policy planning unit, which would facilitate dialogue with senior government officials, target civic leaders of academia, business, and religious communities 
to establish a policy unit that would generate these policy papers, ideas, and options to input into the decision-making process. I see it as a new institutional mechanism for preventing, managing, and resolving conflict that will create the long-term institutional capacity um, for one, implementing these peace agreements, so many that there are, but also building a culture um, and building a community to try to have that sustainable peace. So with that, I will end and look forward to our discussion. Great, thank you. Uh, it's, it's great to hear so many really interesting ideas about how to build institutional capacity uh, and human capacity, really, in government leaders uh, in a place like the DRC. Thank you for that. Uh, next, we're going to turn to uh, Professor Reiko Huang in College Station. I believe that's where she is. Uh, so I'll give a, a second for the technology to turn on. And uh, Professor Huang, if you're ready, uh, you can begin whenever you know you have a signal. If you want to say something just to make sure we can hear you, you, you should probably go ahead and do that. I was going to say, and if you can troubleshoot it while we're talking, okay. Uh, great. Good then let's. Uh, oh. I was going to say, and if you can troubleshoot it. <laughs> believe there might be a lag. Can you hear me? Uh, Good morning. Good morning. Uh, oh. Good morning. I was say, and if you can troubleshoot it. <laughs> believe there might be a lag. Can you hear me? Uh, Good morning. Then let's. Uh, Hello, good morning. Uh, I'm not sure how well you can hear me, Professor Huang, but uh, uh, you are next on our agenda, and uh, go ahead and start. Good morning. I'm very... I'm very sorry. Uh, that I could not join you all in person, but I'm uh, very happy to be on this panel through a uh, conference call. Um, I know that I'm very happy to be on this panel through a uh, conference call. Uh, favorite activity, call. Um, and uh, I'm hearing quite a lot of feedback, so it's a little bit difficult for me, but I'll try to stay focused here. Um, so let me just start with what I have been uh, focusing on in my research. Uh, my research is focused on the behavior of violent rebel groups in countries uh, wracked by civil wars. I've examined in particular how rebel groups organize themselves, where they get the resources needed to fight, and how they relate to local civilian populations. Most of my empirical research has involved a systematic data gathering effort on rebel organization and governance as well as uh, field research in conflict-affected areas. Now, my main uh, aim in this talk is not to recommend a specific development project in a specific country, but I'm also not equivocating here uh, because I do believe uh, that I have a um, more of a policy point to make, um, and I want to start us on a conversation on a more fundamental level about the politics of development interventions in conflict settings and then to point to some ways forward toward the goal of civilian welfare and protection based on what we know from existing research. Now, my main point is uh, that in conflict settings, development programs should target regions uh, where local actors have a demonstrated interest in working for uh, humanitarian causes, and then uh, secondarily to work within the existing political orders in these regions. So allow me to elaborate here. 
First, we might think of areas affected by conflict as being in a state of anarchy uh, that is marked by an absence of political order and of functional institutions. While this may be the case in certain locales, uh, I think that the reality is that in many, con uh, many areas, conflict will have generated its own uh, political order. So that what we find is not anarchy, but pockets of territory throughout the country that are governed by various groups, each with its own wartime governance structures. We see again and again in diverse conflict settings, the ordinary people are remarkably inventive and resilient in the face of state failure and will forge alternative ways to provide order and services among themselves. Now, rebel-held territories are not all alike. In some areas, uh, rebel groups use extensive violence against civilians in order to obtain funds and resources from them and to coerce them into submission. In other areas, however, uh, armed rebel groups are known to invest in the welfare of civilians by building their own political and social institutions, sometimes including their own schools and health clinics, their own legislative councils with elected leaders, and their own set of regulations. So you might think of uh, the FMLN in El Salvador, uh, the Tigrayans or the Eritreans in Ethiopia, the SPLA in Sudan, or the Maoists in Nepal as groups that would uh, belong in this latter category. These are, of course, not bastions of social democracy in a war zone. But uh, the point is that many rebel groups have demonstrated an ability and an interest in providing uh, some level of social and political order in the territories that come under their control. For better or for worse, these groups tend to enjoy some amount of legitimacy among the people that they claim to serve. So which rebel groups tend to do this? Well, it tends to be the ones that need to depend on the local population for wartime support. They typically lack extensive foreign support or access to profits from natural resources. And lacking these external uh, sources of funding, these rebel groups uh, will necessarily turn inward and cater to local populations with the ex expectation that they will receive the people's support in return. But what ultimately matters here isn't their source of income, but the kinds of social relations that they establish with local populations. Some engage in relations of reciprocity uh, with the people, others do not. So why does this matter for intervention? Well, it matters because these types of rebel groups, the, the ones that administer territory and establish their own governance systems, uh, they have an interest in investing in local civilians. Uh, and empirically, and according to recent research, these types of rebel groups have not only provided social services, as I mentioned, They've shown a willingness to work with international development and humanitarian organizations to protect civilians, uh, to comply with international humanitarian law in order to boost their legitimacy at home and abroad, uh, and to use uh, more discriminate violence, targeting, for instance, state forces rather than the people under their control. So these observations lead me to the following insights for development interventions in conflict and post-conflict areas. Uh, very broadly, intervention, sh I think, should take into account these pre-existing political orders and work with actors who have a vested interest in ensuring civilian welfare. Specifically, I think that intervention, interventions should work alongside or even within these existing governance structures. Typically, development interventions attempt to build parallel institutions to provide security and deliver social services. The result is that they end up duplicating or even overriding similar efforts by locally supported groups. The longer term result is that foreign programs will end up forestalling the development of local systems of governance. Furthermore, when local actors are shut out of formal development programs, they can interpret these programs as an effort to politically marginalize them and their communities. When this occurs, uh, they may decide to expel international aid groups altogether from their territories, um, thus ultimately harming the civilians who reside there. The alternative to this local level state building is to engage in a more top-down uh, international effort to strengthen the central government, which is often a uh, part of the overarching goal of a development program. Uh, but this can be deeply problematic 
in a country where the central government has historically been associated、uh, in the minds of many people with violence, corruption, and the abuse of power and wealth, rather than with stability and social order. So, unless interventions are sensitive to these political histories,、uh, they can potentially contribute to a renewal of conflict. Um, and that's why I very much uh, like uh, Jendai's uh, proposal for a Congo、uh, Institute of Peace, where,、um, as she emphasized,、uh, the dependence and the emphasis would be very, be very much on、uh, local expertise uh, for uh, policy ideas,、uh, generating policy ideas and options. So the bottom line here is that development interventions should be aware of and take into account. Pre-existing institutions of civilian governance and to work within these structures. So, what does this look like in practice? We can see some examples from、uh, recent experience. In the Sudanese conflict,、uh, international aid groups worked directly with the SPLA rebel administration to deliver aid in the south, knowing that if they failed to do so, they may not have been granted access to rebel territories. Uh, which had dire humanitarian needs. A groups also knew that if they did not work directly with the SPLA, the latter would perceive the pres presence of these international development actors as a challenge to their own claims of authority in、uh, South Sudan. Likewise, in Sri Lanka, the Tamil Tigers, the LTTE,、uh, have created、uh, an extensive rebel administration in the northeast. And、uh, during the war, and especially during the ceasefire between 2003 and 2007,、uh, international development and relief organizations worked directly with the LTTE and its humanitarian wing to coordinate aid in rebel territories. We see the same thing happening in the 1980s with the Tigrayan rebels in、uh, Ethiopia, as well as、uh, Eritrean rebels. Uh, uh, Fighting for independence uh, uh, of Eritrea,、uh, both of these groups created their own humanitarian relief groups to coordinate international aid activities,、uh, and aid groups worked directly with the、uh, organizations to deliver critical humanitarian aid. So, in each of these instances, instances, rebel groups and international aid groups had a shared interest in ensuring civilian welfare. And each side、uh, chose to work with the other toward that shared end.、Uh, I think with positive results. Now, what are some of the challenges of this approach that I'm proposing here? Well, the challenges are multiple. Working with these groups means working with violent actors or with actors with a history of violence. Many of these groups will espouse community norms that clash with global norms of rights and justice. Working with these groups may be seen as a compromise on the neutrality of the interve intervening group.、Uh, although, I think from the local perspective, external interventions are rarely, if ever, perceived to be neutral. Rebel groups may also siphon off aid resources to enrich themselves.、Uh, for instance, this was a reality that aid groups working in Sudan came to accept during the conflict. Nevertheless, the alternative of sidelining these groups and working exclusively with the central government to strengthen formal government institutions and services requires very lengthy and significant international commitments to centralized state building. More fruitful and effective,、uh, in my view, to acknowledge the existence of a multiplicity of actors who have control over populations. And to engage with them for the goal of civilian protection and human capital. Thank you very much. Thank you.、Uh, I know it's difficult to give a presentation、uh, when you're hearing yourself just 30 seconds ago,、uh, but you did a fabulous job. We were able to hear everything、uh, very clearly, and thank you for that presentation. Nice job.、Uh, with that, let me turn it over to Claire Lockhart. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. And, and really, I'm delighted to be here. I think, especially in an era of fiscal austerity, development agencies are compelled to move more to a partnership model. And what better than partnering with the best of America in terms of its, the best of its human capital, the university? So thrilled that USAID is doing more of this.、Um, I'll start with quick reflections on on institutional human capital, and then move to some concrete suggestions. And I'm afraid I'm one of the people who didn't exactly follow follow my instructions because I have four suggestions rather than just one.、Um, so I think on the question of institutional capital,、um, a lot of the work of of the institute where I work at focuses on on institution building and state building. 
and the relationship with peacebuilding and, and preventing conflict. And I think as, as a lot of the evidence is showing, for sustainable peace, and this, you know, this is this is not new. It was the, the Carnegie Commission back in the mid '90s, and the UN Panel on Threats and Challenges that capable, responsive, accountable states are really at the root of both conflict prevention and successful, sustainable peace building. Um, now. What those institutions look like, of course, will be very context specific, but I think there are some common elements um, for institutions everywhere. So I think what, what, certainly what we found in our field research is that citizens across the world expect the same kind of services, the same kind of functions um, from their state. Now, in a particular context, how this is sequenced and how institution building works in practice will again be very much needed to be tailored to context. Um, the second, the, the question of human capital, and of course, institutions um, rely on, on people. And um, what we found is, in a sense, the human capital of the country is often neglected, either, as, as the previous speaker mentioned, because the aid complex sometimes, I think, inadvertently tries actually marginalize this, the human capital of a country, the people of a country, in creating these parallel systems, um, or inadvertently, I think, because the wrong kind of frameworks, frameworks not suited to context, are put in place. And I'll give one example here. You know, the Millennium Development Goals very much put at the forefront. One of its goals was primary education. I think no one, especially a parent, can... can disagree or argue with the importance of primary education. But what we've seen in practice in many contexts is that this has actually skewed funding and resources away from secondary, away from vocational and tertiary education, especially in post-conflict or conflict-affected contexts. And what does that do? It de-skills the population. You may have every child in school up to the age of 11, which is fantastic. But what about the teenagers? And is that society being equipped so that the people from their own country can manage um, the public sector, the private sector, the civic institutions, rather than relying on external technical assistance. So I think an agenda of right-sizing education, skills, and training agenda to conflict and post-conflict countries is, is really fundamental um, to sustainability um, and is also very timely, um, especially because the, the MDGs themselves are up for discussion and renewal about what kind of framework comes next. Um, and then third, a particular... Um, uh, angle on, on human capital, I think it's the youth dimension, and, and I'll touch on this a little bit later. Um, what we're seeing is statistics, and, and um, academics in the room may have better statistics than I do, but the, the number that we keep coming up against in the field is something like 60 to 70 percent of the population is under 30 or under 25. And we know this from the demographic data that many of the conflict-affected and fragile states, not all of them, are suffering from the opposite problem than, that many developed countries are suffering from, which is an aging population, but these vastly expanding young populations could be an enormous opportunity for growth and dynamism of the societies, but is also a challenge in terms of stress on social services and in terms of security if the, the young populations are not given a stake in the society in future. So what, what kind of interventions might I propose? And I think there could be any number, but I'm going to put four um, suggestions on the table with reference to most of my work for, for five years has been in Afghanistan, so I will refer to Afghanistan, but also some of the other countries that my colleagues and I have, have studied, visited, and, and worked with, including Pakistan, Indonesia, and South Sudan. Um, I think the, f the first one is to look at the question of institution building. And I think, again, very much that we, we are in an era of fiscal austerity, and the model of institution that building that relies on multi-hundred million dollar co contracts to contractors is possibly over, and, and possibly should be over. And I think this is where partnerships with uni a university become even more valuable, both in terms of research and practice, what actually works in institution building. And what we've found is actually many of the most successful attempts at institution building don't actually cost that much money. Um, it's about getting the right design, the right partnerships in place, and the right process in place. And, um, any one of, um, in, in the book that Dr. Ghani and I wrote, we said here are the 10 functions of the state. It could be five, it could be 15. It has to be very much context specific. And I think one could select any one of a number of different institutions to study, to look at the sort of the, the theory and the practice of institution building. The one that I would suggest is the question of revenue mobilization. Um, the, I know that the US government has recently launched an initiative called Domestic Financing Deve for Development. And the question of how a country can mobilize the, its own resources to pay for some of it, the own costs, its own costs of operating this, of, of the 
expenses, the, the budgetary expenses, but also the, the, the expenses of implementing a peace agreement. Uh, one of the studies we did was to interview SRSG, special reps of the Secretary General, and ask them what was their biggest regret in the implementation of a peace agreement. And they all, without fail, said our biggest regret, or one of the top two, was that we forgot about the fiscal side and we forgot about economics. So we promised all these things in the peace agreement, but then we couldn't pay for them. Um, and not only that, it's not as though the economy doesn't happen. We, do, we have a criminalized economy. We didn't focus enough on the creation of legitimate institutions, legitimate economy. So building on that, one of my proposals would be to focus on the institutions and the capacity of the state for re legitimate revenue mobilization. I think the other connection here to conflict prevention or peace building is if legitimate authorities aren't collecting it, and, and, and channeling it to legitimate expenditures, the health system, the education system, it's often the illegitimate groups, um, the criminal networks, who are collecting this revenue, whether it's customs or um, natural resources. I know you'll be addressing that question tomorrow. So the leakages of financing, of the finances, I think there's very strong evidence that this does fuel conflict. So I propose this intervention of, of legitimate revenue mobilization, both the, 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 the empirical, collecting empirical evidence, what, what actually works, and what are some, and then working on the practice of what type of interventions work to, to increase that, that legitimate revenue collection. I think we all know that Pakistan is one of the places that really suffers from a very low tax to GDP ratio, but I think also in Afghanistan it's a critical issue. Um, the ability of the Afghan state to finance its own expenditures is going to be absolutely fundamental to that country's stability, especially in an era where the international taxpayers quite rightly are becoming weary of financing that initiative only through aid dollars. Um, Second suggestion, um, proposed intervention, and these actually are interventions already very much underway, but I think they could really benefit from um, university partnerships, is, is um, large-scale community development. Um, in Afghanistan, National Solidarity Program was a program I was privileged to be part of the team with somebody called Scott Guggenheim, who's an American anthropologist. And... Um, it functions, it, it was the first program to be up and running on a national scale, and it, it basically works. It collects money into a trust fund and then gives a block grant to every village in the country. It's now in 31,000 villages, and the way that it works is the, the village doesn't have to have the block grant, but if they want it, um, they must do, essentially there are three rules. There must be a village at selection of, an, of a council. And 99 times out of 100, the village chooses to have an election. A quorum of the village meets to choose a project. And then um, they have to put up accounts in a public place. Now, this, the CDD method, will be very well known to, to most of you. Um, but I think what a couple of questions that are particularly of, of interest in the conflict prevention and, and peace building field. Um, the, there's a program at NSP in Afghanistan. I think little known is that actually... The, the, it evolved out of two other programs. One is the RSPN, which is a program that exists in Pakistan and has done for 30 years, and very much grew out of the Aga Khan development network's work, um, but also a number of, of Pakistan researchers and academics. Um, and it also grew out, in, to some extent, of a program that was put in, in place in Indonesia, has now been up and running for 15 years, called P, now called PNPM, was KDP. And I think this family of programs are all operating... Um, at a village level, at very large scale. In Pakistan, I think it's in over 30,000 villages. In Indonesia, it's in 80,000 villages. And each of them has been used in different ways to manage, mitigate um, conflict at the local level. Um, and I think it calls for some, some, both some study and some um, assistance with practice on how to strengthen the way that those are used to, to mitigate conflict. And particularly, one idea would be the cross-border dimension. Just in November the first delegation, and it's unbelievable. NSP has been running for over 10 years. Its neighbor in Pakistan, this network of villages, has been running for 30 years, but they'd never organized a formal exchange. And just in November, the first delegation from Pakistan um, of the, some village leaders went to visit their counterparts in Afghanistan. And towards the end of the visit, they made a, the, the Pakistan delegation made a formal speech to the, the Afghan counterparts and said, yeah, this is extraordinary. We must congratulate you on you know, what you've been able to achieve. You've been only going 10 years, but we've learned so many things. To, and these are the four or five ways that we think you do it better than us. So we're going to take these lessons back. But more importantly, they said, what we've learned is, we, they said, we're actually very angry. Uh, and we're going to go straight back to our leaders in Pakistan because we, we now know that we've been fed a pack of lies by our politicians and the media in Pakistan because we've seen that you are actually very capable of running yourselves as a country. 
Now, you, you were able to build legitimate institutions and you have this capability. We've been told that Afghans are, are useless and can't run themselves, which is why Pakistan has to run Afghanistan for it. So anyway, they, long story short, they went back to Pakistan and have now launched a period of exchanges, including with media, to try and change the view of Afghanistan within Pakistan. And I think something like that, a, a, a village to, to reinforce an initiative like that would be one suggestion to take that forward. I'm probably running out of time. I'll, I'll be short on the last two. Okay, yeah. Um, the third one really is to look at this question of, of human capital and really to p perhaps eventually to challenge the, the notion of, of, you know, absolutely primary education is important, but do we need a slightly different framework for post-conflict and conflict-affected countries? And I think what an, what an intervention would look like would actually be to work on with counterparts within the country on what is the right framework for prioritizing human capital needs. And I think that would be the question of what skills and capabilities does, it, does the human capital of the country need to be able to equip its own public and private sector institutions? And what does that mean for sequencing, policy interventions, um, you know, how many teachers, doctors, accountants, engineers, lawyers, peace builders does the country need? And, and is the curricula attuned to creating the kind of citizens that the country wants in future? And I think that could be done at a national level, or it could be done at a very localized on the level of a city or a province. I'm not recommending Soviet-style manpower planning. Many of my friends have warned me against that. But somewhere in between manpower planning and what we have today, which is a completely ad hoc approach. Um, and then final, final suggestion, and it's really a subset of that, which is to focus on teenagers and youth as a category. And I, I know that I imagine USAID already has many programs that do that, but I, our field work, I think, demonstrates again and again that we focus a lot on children up to the age of 11. <laughs> and we focus on adults, but there is a category of teenagers and, and youth um, who often present a security challenge. These are the people who join insurgencies. These are the people who demonstrate on the streets, sometimes for very good reasons. Um, but are, do these people have, um, and as Fernando de Soto would put it, are we, are we, are, do they have a stake in the system? And what are their pathways to inclusion, both through the education system, through the employment market, but other ways um, for, for inclusion? Um, if I had a fifth, I would very much have um, talked about national dialogues and civic engagement along the lines of the sense you had, so just very much endorse that initiative as well. I'll stop there. Thank you, Claire. That was great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Kleena Raleigh. Um, can everybody? Yes. Okay. So um, I'm going to deviate a bit, and I'm going to talk mainly about evidence and data and analysis of conflict patterns, and then present some trends we have derived from recent data on um, subnational and disaggregated political violence to kind of question some of the assumptions that many people may have about um, the type of violence that's mainly occurring across Africa. So the good news is, is that there has been a disaggregated revolution in conflict data collection. Um, there is quite a lot of data now available in various forms um, for policymakers or academics to use. Um, increasingly, these data or some of these data are available in real time with a consistent framework uh, and methodologies. And the form of event collection allows for systematic comparisons, which is actually what we want, I would imagine, both as academics and policymakers. Um, one of the things that I find particularly good about this new disaggregated revolution is that there's been an expansion of what political violence is. We've heard quite a lot about rebel groups and various forms of violence, but in fact, we're actually seeing that rebel groups are becoming less important, especially across Africa and the international system, but they're being replaced by other forms of conflict, mainly political militias and uh, riots and protests. So um, there are, of course, some remaining challenges with data collection. Um, we're all reliant mainly on what I would recall secondary data sources. And one way that that can be improved is through some sort of partnership and communication with development agencies who often have very good data on specific areas that they usually don't share. But one of the nice parts about uh, collaboration with um, other data sets is that we can use those information or that information in ways where we can transform it into something that can be used for evidence-based programming quite easily. Um, there's, of course, a wide range of sources, as you can imagine, to come up with very, very fine-grained information about conflict in developing countries and certain states. Um, some 
data sets focus on different types of sources, um, but most, of course, the most reliable focus on local sources. And of course, there's a politicization of the actual material coming out of certain states, which many of us have tried to get around by basically reporting on a wide range of sources and letting the user themselves decide on the politicization. <clears throat> so on the notion of research, academics use, use these data basically to look at um, links between frameworks and what we're actually seeing on the ground, whereas policymakers obviously want to use it for <coughs> Sorry, there's something in my throat. Policymakers often want to use it for evidence-based programming and to look at the effectiveness of programs. And that is actually all possible. But the number one thing we are struggling with as data providers is what exactly do policymakers want and how do they want it? We hear quite a range of, of requests, but nothing quite systematic so we know exactly what it is we can provide for people. So... Moving on to what the data has actually told us, if we look at the patterns of conflict across Africa today, we actually see, as I mentioned before, that subnationally, rebel groups are becoming far less important than they ever have been before. And they are being replaced by these political militias or private armies, if you will. So civil wars or civil war contexts like Somalia and DRC and Mali are really characterized by complex emergencies, which I'm more than happy to get into in the question period. There has been a drastic increase in riots and protests. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and that's potentially a coding issue, but actually it indicates, I would say, as Jack Goldstone has argued, a uh, rise in urbanization without development. And of course, the grievances that tend to come along with that. So if we look at the places that were most violent in 2012, we can actually see very clearly this range I speak about. <clears throat> we have Somalia, South Africa, Nigeria, DR Congo, and Egypt were the most violent countries last year. And of course, this represents a wide range of types of actors, which we haven't really discussed today. Um, the main breakdown, I would say, are the future possibilities for violence. <laughs> include failed states, such as DR Congo and Somalia that I mentioned, although that's not a phrase I'm crazy about. Um, Post-conflict, which is very distinct from post-war states, again, which um, I'm happy to get into, or new variations, such as what we see in Nigeria, Zimbabwe, and Kenya. In fact, if anything, I would say that these are the states that we should be focusing on because they represent what's likely to come in the future. And that's it. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Mm. Uh, at this stage, I was probably a little bit uh, undetailed about how the structure of the morning would go because I neglected to say that a respondents panel will follow, uh, although not directly, uh, after the comments made uh, by the initial panelists as part of the mechanism for getting more and more ideas on the table. Um, but before we turn to the respondents panel, which will happen um, at 1030, or I guess after a break, and then, uh, yeah, after a break, so it's starting at 11 o'clock. Uh, we'd like to now get some reactions to what you've heard. Uh, the, I think I was at one stage thinking I would give the panelists an opportunity to react to the other presentations, uh, but I'm also eager to get the audience in the mix. And so I think what I'll do is hopefully you'll have the opportunity to react um, in your response to audience questions to other things that you've heard, and we'll try to blend it in that way. Um, and so with that, I'd like to open it up to the floor. Um, I'd also like to open it up to the virtual world. Uh, we're also taking questions via Twitter. Uh, the handle is uh, at condevcenter, C-O-N-D-E-V, center. And the hashtag is H-E-S-N. Uh, so if you tweet a question, we're going to get it, uh, and we'll broadcast that here as well. Uh, so with that, we'll open up for questions. Uh, there are microphones in the room. We ask that you stand so that the cameras can find you and speak into the microphone so that we can all hear you. And the first one is always the most difficult. I'll kick it off to uh, get things started. I'm Malcolm Phelps, the USAID Education Advisor to Afghanistan. And my comment or 
I think a question is going to be embedded in here, I'm not sure where, is for Claire. And uh, when you commented that uh, uh, on the relative benefits of primary versus tertiary education, I nearly leaped to my feet in applause because that's been one of our greatest challenges uh, in USAID in general, um, but in Afghanistan in particular, as you well know. Um, so why is there this uh, emphasis on primary education? Well, one reason is a World Bank study a number of years ago that pointed to the uh, economic benefits uh, in terms of lifetime earnings to, uh, for primary education, those benefits being greater uh, for primary. Now, nobody would dispute that primary education is important, and we've had tremendous success in Afghanistan, but to a certain extent um, we're victims of our success because we now have increased, increased the uh, throughput of the system. Last year uh, only about 20 percent of the high school graduates received seats in university and they all expect it. So you're generating a lot of very disgruntled and dissatisfied people. So um, I guess the embedded question here is I see three areas of argument in favor of tertiary and they're all must be tied to job creation because getting kids through uh, tertiary or training or higher education um, is only part of, of the issue. They've got to have jobs at the end of it. So you, you can see economic benefits that can be quantified. Um, you can see institutional capacity benefits that I think all of the panelists uh, discussed. The more difficult one to quantify and articulate I think is the social benefits and I believe that you mentioned that. So I, uh, the, the, the question now that I've rambled on is uh, has to do with how to how would you see us being able to better articulate the um, the argument in favor of a better balance of uh, for tertiary education and and training so thank you well it, thank you for the comments and questions and I, I, I certainly I thought if I stopped working on everything else and focused on one issue, it would be this, because you know, every country you go to, currently afflicted by conflict, or the young people say, where do I get a job? Where do I get a skill? Um, the Afghanistan, I mean, you're right, it was the, back in just after the Bonn Agreement in 2001, I was witnessed the, the needs assessment process that the UN and the World Bank did, and the team came to, to Afghanistan, and they said, until every last girl and boy is in primary school, no child in this country will go to secondary school. And the, they cited two studies, in fact. One, the one you mentioned, about the returns to primary being so much greater than secondary, tertiary, or vocational. Um, they also cited a, st a series of studies from South America that argued that, that demonstrated that there had been elite capture of universities. But I don't think the, res the response to that is, you should have no universities. <laughs> it's about then making them meritocratic and open <laughs> so that you don't have elite capture. Um, and I think, the, in a way, the, the, way, the reason the World Bank study was misleading, it, the, maybe the comparative returns may be better for primary. But if you have no secondary, tertiary, or, or vocational, where are the teachers going to come from that are even going to underpin the primary system that you're building? So I think, as, as you would agree. Um, so I think that was a very tragic, that if there was one major mistake, there were many mistakes made in Afghanistan in, in the early years, but if the, that was probably the biggest. And, you know, and so what happened was the Afghan budget team were forced to defund the secondary tertiary system, which was actually already in place. Now, some of it has limped on, you know, some of it's in place. So I would say it's not only ter tertiary, but it's also secondary, it's also vocational. It's the whole, it's the whole system from age four to when you're in the, in the workforce. And as you said, it's about creating alignments because there's no point in producing 10,000 PhDs in, in botany if there aren't the, <laughs> the jobs as botanists afterwards. Um, there's actually somebody called Dr. Mo Kayumi, who's now president of San Jose University. He was a product of the USAID series of scholarships to AUB in the 60s, 70s, and he's actually been working actually for California on a system 
um, that goes to industry and the public sector and says, what kind of skills are you short of? Where are you going to have the jobs? Aligns the places at university and the places, the, the kids at, in the secondary schools and creates that kind of alignment system. And he's thinking of piloting that in Afghanistan as well. How do you create this, this kind of alignment? Um, so, so we're delighted to put you in touch with him. But I think I, I agree with you. It's, it's two things. How can one articulate the argument and challenge some of these early studies. Um, we've been actually looking into this at the moment <clears throat> and have found some more recent studies that actually do show that, that there are different types of returns to secondary and tertiary, and the system needs to work as a, hold, as a whole. So I think some of that evidence, data, and arguments are now coming much more to the fore. I think the opportunity really is to, and for those of you engaged with the MDG, post-MDG discussion, if we can get a different global goal in this regard, it could be very important. And then specifically for Afghanistan, I do think there are some um, interventions that could be made, or a number of other countries, which is really about exactly right-sizing the education training system and aligning it to the type of jobs that will be available. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Uh, my name is Tag Demet. I'm with the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. Um, I just want to follow on quickly to some points here. Um, first, one of the problems is that education is viewed as a silo within donors' uh, um, portfolios. That in fact, higher education actually builds capacity for democracy and governance. It builds capacity for health. It builds capacity for environmental issues and economic growth issues. And unfortunately, what you do is you usually have a budget where uh, basic education competes with uh, secondary education and competes with higher education. And I think that's a fundamental problem with the way donors' portfolios are structured. The second thing I would say is that uh, for those of you who are interested in a fairly complete analysis of the value of higher education and development, you might look at Walter McMahon's book, uh, um, uh, Higher Education. Uh, Greater learning, uh, higher, wait, higher education, greater learning. It's published by John Hopkins, and it, it critiques those early studies, work by Bloom from Harvard on economic growth in uh, uh, Africa, uh, equally shows that higher education has a major role in development and its uh, value calculated by the studies of the World Bank back in the late 70s is only about a third of the overall economic and social impact of higher education. So. Um, I would say that higher education is particularly important in places like Afghanistan, where I've worked for six years. Um, and I think one of the great failures of the ef uh, effect there is that th if you talk about sustainability, there's nobody there to sustain the effort that's been conducted on the ground. Uh, they should have been trained. And if we'd started that in the beginning, we would have a, a cohort to, to carry that on and sustain it now. So it's important in conflict uh, countries. It's also important in almost every country. So thank you. Uh, other questions? Uh, my question also is, I'm Russell Rand with the School of Rural Public Health at Texas A&M. My question to you is also to Claire, actually. Uh, I quite... Uh, resonate your your excitement in, in primary education because I also think uh, that addresses uh, conflicts from the from the root cause actually would would you Claire agree with me with if I said that in any conflict prone nation or any conflict region if you address the young and the old uh, simultaneously like early childhood education or uh, elementary education, and then find ways to, to look into the, the seniors or the elderly population of the country, then the middle part can be actually be taken care of on its own over a period of time. So I'm talking in terms of, of an organic approach rather than a bandage uh, approach. Or uh, let's, uh, instead of looking at a problem, okay, here is a conflict, let's go and mitigate conflict and, and put a bandage on it and fix it. Or let's go to the root cause of how the problems come about and uh, approaches that would, that would stand against the madrasas, uh, which, would, which would actually work against 
uh, what our efforts are. So uh, how do you think, do you, would you concur with me that, that, that if, you, if you address conflict uh, right from uh, birth to geriatrics would probably be a, a, a good way of thinking and how to do that, I really don't know, but perhaps you may have a, a quick thought in your mind. Thank you. No, no, no. Please. Well, I, I will just be very short. I think the, and what you're really raising is the intergenerational aspects of addressing conflict. And I think uh, this is not an, an area that I'm expert in, so I'll be very short. <laughs> but in terms of our field work, I mean, I think, as I mentioned, we, we seem to find that the, 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 the teenagers and young people are neglected as a category and engaging with them. And where we've seen in, uh, programs that engage with the youth specifically, um, it can have a, a tremendously positive impact. But I think you're also raising the, the older generation and, and engaging with them in ways that they can play different roles. Makes sense. I'm not sure I know enough about, I, instinctively, I'd probably say leaving out the middle would seem to be risky, um, but working, having tailored programs or t tailored anal analysis that understands you need different approaches to different generations in a different context certainly seems um, like an important way to proceed. Um, and if I take Afghanistan as an example, um, I think you know, what we've seen is there's a, there's a generation who grew up in the 80s who are now coming to retirement age and finding one approach to give them sufficient honor that they still have a place in society, but understanding that there's a next generation now coming of age um, is one, how to handle that almost the succession issues, not just of which president takes over, but succession issues more broadly between generations. You know, other, the color revolutions, um, you know, in, in Georgia, a much younger generation came um, to govern very, very early, so you had a, a generational shift much earlier. But understanding those, those generational needs and shifts seemed, would seem to be a very important part of conflict prevention and, and recovery. I was just going to mention very quickly that there seems to be um, an assumption about conflict labor, that it in fact is one of the main factors in explaining violence. Um, and I would say that that is not very strongly supported. Um, there, because people focus on young people or young men, usually um, unemployed young men, they tend to depoliticize quite a lot of the experiences that the population in general have or the elite competition and fragmentation that happens widely across these states, which actually explains far more conflict than the proportion of people who are underemployed or unemployed. And so I would just hesitate very strongly um, the demographic approach to, to explaining violence patterns. I'm glad you flagged that issue. I mean, this is something that the literature um, has really helped to establish, if you can establish that um, there isn't an exactly clear relationship between uh, the presence of a youth bulge and um, the risks of future conflict. But it does raise questions about what the missing ingredients are. Um, when, we, when we do have a sense that youth populations in a particular context are in some sense driving conflict dynamics, uh, answering questions about why is that the case, uh, what types of institutional capacities are missing, uh, what types of uh, better forms of local governance or national governance would be helpful. Those are, all, those are all pretty important questions. And then on the flip side, questions about if we were to intervene with youth populations, what are we trying to accomplish? Are we trying to accomplish uh, sort of better broad-based skills to engage in the economy? Or are we trying to accomplish a heightened sense of civic uh, education? Um, you know, it, it could be that both of those or either of those um, capacities, I'm not saying this right, it could be that those capacities have differential effects on the risks of conflict. Um, but I don't know that we, we know the answers to that, and those seem like open questions that we would want to address. Uh, other questions? There are a lot of them now. You're close to him with the microphone, so I think uh, we can go with it. <laughs> uh, I'm Jerry Brown with the uh, Institute for Economic Stability. Thank you very much for, for the panel and the, the great discussion. Um, just curious, there's a lot of discussion about places that aren't working. Um, I think we decided not to use failed states, but the actors formerly known as failed states. Um, any examples across the panel of places where this worked, where you can say they did the right things, um, we either, and it, and it gets a little tough because you either say, well, it could have spiraled into conflict, but it didn't. Or um, in the, uh, the segmentation, I think that uh, uh, Dr. Raleigh used, uh, post-conflict, 
um, ongoing conflict, uh, et cetera. Across the panel, any places that we can look for, they did it right, we should do, we can learn something from what they did. Sure, I'll, I'll take a stab in um, one of my favorite places is Kenya. Uh, and, you know, obviously in any society, any country, the story's still to be told <laughs> because history is dynamic in that way. Um, but if you look at the 2007, 2008 post-conflict violence in Kenya, um, and the reaction to that in which their institutions essentially were rejected as the type of mediation role that they should have in resolving societal and political conflict. Obviously, we had a government of national unity, not the prettiest thing. Um, you know, so many ministries, just a very bloated um, government to accommodate um, all of these different uh, political forces, um, or the major two political forces, and then all of their subgroups within them. Fast forward to 2013 in their election, and the difference, I would argue, is that the society and the political class had established new institutions with greater legitimacy. And those institutions were then respected as the mediators between the political conflict between the loser and the winner. Um, as judged by their institutions. Uh, and, I, and I think that, 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 that the sense of confidence that the public felt in a new constitution that devolved power from the center. And so everybody felt that they would have a better share in political power as well as economic power through the county assemblies and the, um, the county governorships that were established. So the devolution of power through the constitution the new development of a judiciary system or the rule of law um, that was not seen as simply packed or with the, you know, the appointees of the president, but through a legitimate process of, of vetting and selection. Um, and even the Independent Electoral Boundary Commission, which arguably had major challenges in this last election in terms of their, you know, procurement of equipment, the electronic a voter system basically failing, um, but then going to the courts and making a determination. So I think the, 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 the fact that, you know, Kenya didn't address all of the root causes of the, you know, previous um, violent, you know, most violent in 2007, but previous violent elections, you know, like land and other issues, but they have the new institutions and the confidence in the public in the ability to manage that. And I think that you know, the, the, the basic point that I'm trying to make is that the, the, the most sustainable and best resolution of conflict is when domestic institutions, national institutions, play their role um, and build sort of legitimacy in playing that role over time. Um, and I think that that's, the, that's one of the keys, and that's why I think that this session is so very important on focusing on institutional capacity. I know you want to get in on this, um, but before, I want to make sure that uh, Reiko Huang, uh, she may still be online, and if she ever wants to, to get in on this, I want to make sure that she has an opportunity. So Vince, I don't know if you're in communication with her, but if she wants to get in, could you just sort of give me a, a heads up? Okay, perfect. Uh, Cleon. Thanks very much. Um, I was just going to second that Kenya does um, appear to have had a, quite a successful election um, for various reasons. But, um, but even in what I was, the distinction I was trying to make between post-war, post-conflict, conflictual, conflictual, et cetera, is that Kenya is still quite a violent place. It's just that the violence has relatively low fatalities. It happens largely in pastoral communities or on the East um, involving often Somali militants, and they have a very high rate of riots and protests. Now, that's not necessarily going to be a deal breaker. And in fact, I think we, we do have to accept a certain amount of um, societal conflict that emerges from societies in transition. Um, but I think to, to, uh, to support Jindani's point, I think Malawi was an excellent case where the institutions of the state allowed for um, a peaceful transition when it could have gotten quite messy. Other questions? Kerry? Uh, sure. My name is Kerry Grunlow, and I'm a senior conflict analyst with USAID. And my question is also related to governance. 
And the question is whether in DRC and similar countries, governance practices and sort of going back to, to separating out institutional capacity from elite behaviors, um, elite fragmentation, and sort of these general governance practices that have become so embedded in so many countries over time, whether or not that would constrain the success of, of making, um, making the governance process and decision-making process more inclusive in the way that you've suggested. And what sorts of things might be built into that to help to account for that, for the very sort of pervasive embedded governance practices that are somewhat exclusionary and exclusive in terms of elite power? Sure, thank you. It's a, it's a good question um, and um, one that I've thought a, a bit about. And I think that w what we're really talking about in DRC in terms of governance is personal networks. Um, and that's why there's a certain opaqueness about the decision-making process. Um, and it, it really revealed itself, quite frankly, in it, it's, it's a question of who has the ear of the president. Well, in every country, it's a question of who has the ear of the president, but there's a process by which one can see um, uh, uh, options percolating in the system, right? And there's some healthy contestation and debate about those options. Um, but in Congo, just to be very specific, um, when um, Augustine Mwanki died, who had the ear of the president, right? Um, and there was a huge vacuum that I think really revealed the nature of the personal um, network in the decision-making process. And that's because there became a contest of who's going to replace him, right? So there's a jockeying for influence with the president. Um, there are institutions, obviously, that contest that, Parliament in particular, but I think that the way that I'm thinking about how do you break that network is, first of all, you, you can't immediately. Um, so you're trying to build in institutional capacity in an environment of which personal networks are the key to decisions. Um, to do that, you have to get a person to lead an institute that is part of that network. Right? I mean, that person has to have the personal relationships within government and civil society to, have the, to be able to build that bridge, you know, in both places. Um, secondly, you need someone to lead an institute that has legitimacy and standing. Um, and so they are seen as, as, you know, not just another, you know, uh, what do we call these people, crony, right? Not just another crony, but someone who really reflects the type of transition and transformation of governance that we're looking for. Um, so the leadership, I think, is very, very important. And then, so, you know, legitimacy of, of the leadership, someone who is also well-connected, um, and so therefore can, you know, navigate um, the personal networks and understands them quite well. Um, and then sort of there's going to be natural bureaucratic resistance to any kind of institutional change. And so I think that really is a matter um, of strategic sequencing, right, um, and, and targeting sort of low-hanging fruit and taking on projects and, and opportunities that don't, that don't directly contest against the strongest bureaucratic resistors. Right, and so I, I, I really do think that that has to be managed very carefully and very locally. Um, so those are some ideas about how, how you deal with this. Even, even people who have benefited from these personal networks get tired of it. <laughs> you know? So there, there comes an opportunity, a window of opportunity to change. And I think that in uh, DRC, we're seeing that window of opportunity. Let's, uh, let's get maybe three or four questions on board, because I'm uh, aware of the time. We have about 15 minutes left. Um, so why don't we go all the way in the back, and we'll kind of make our way forward. OK, and we'll see how to field them. Thanks. Hi. Um, I'm Trisha DiGennaro. I'm from USAID, uh, Office of Civilian Military Cooperation. And um, Ambassador Fr touched on this a bit, and as did um, Haranko, about militia groups and civil military cooperation. 
Um, I think in a lot of these insta instances, post-conflict, which is very different from post-war, which you said, we have to deal with um, development while our counterparts are building militaries and or there are a lot of militias left over from the war conflict. Um, so I think this is a very big issue as far as the transition economy. And whoever wants to touch on that, how we can work with our partners, including state and defense, that are bringing foreign military sales and weapons in the region, trying to work with the militias to bring them either into the military or to trial. And then some of the interagency or civil issues um, for awareness of civilian military um, standards, cooperation, et cetera, in order to move forward in some of these trans transitions for a greater stability. Thanks. My name is Melanie Kwano Chu, and I'm with the Alliance for Peacebuilding. Um, I wanted to say thank you to USAID and for the panelists in particular. Um, Ambassador Frazier, I, I really like your um, reliance on learnings from African peacebuilders. And um, if there could be some link, if that is a suggestion that's taken up with the Carnegie Corporation's African peacebuilding network that they've set up within the last year or two. Um, I think that would be beneficial. And then I have a question for Professor Huang, particularly on engaging rebel group dynamics. And perhaps this is a bit of a DC-based question um, in the sense of how do you practically do that in the midst of the Holder humani versus humanitarian law uh, material support rulings that we've seen in the last recent years. Um, if she has any information on, on whether or not that particular ruling has hindered um, civil society working with uh, groups that are now on terrorist watch lists. Thank you. Any other yes, please. Uh, uh, Paul Summers from California State University, uh, Fresno. Yeah, uh, Claire, you mentioned uh, one issue to uh, consider is this large scale community development. And you mentioned the NSP uh, Afghanistan in particular. Um, I, I'm just wondering, what priorities did these uh, communities identify? What are some of them that they came up with? And did these priorities um, vary, let's say, by degree of armed conflict in their area? Or maybe, you know, Afghanistan is so varied maybe by parts of the country, if you could perhaps give us an idea of that. And were some of these community priorities similar to international aid priorities? Um, I guess from a practitioner's standpoint, I'd be very interested. Thank you. Great. Why don't we start with that um, and uh, move forward? I, the, so I, I tried to uh, capture these questions, and if, if I get this wrong, uh, let me know. But the first one has to do with how do you deal with existing militias or other violent groups while you're doing development? Um, and how would we work within the interagency? Uh, to better achieve our goals? That's one question. Uh, a second question has to do with uh, the presentation from um, Professor Huang about how do you engage rebel groups in the process of humanitarian assistance? How do you do that on a practical basis, given especially a lot of the rules uh, and prohibitions about working with some groups? And then thirdly, um, how do the priorities of some of the communities we've worked with in Afghanistan, I think that's right, um, how did they identify some of their priorities? To what extent did they confer, converge with USAID priorities? Um, and to what extent were those priorities affected by the degree of conflict? By, okay. So those are the questions on the table. And uh, I'll leave it open. Uh, we'll certainly want to get Professor Huang on for the question directed to her. I'm just going to briefly state that um, I don't know how to answer the first question because it's very complicated. But I would say that there has not been enough attention to what I often refer to as the conflict marketplace, which is how different groups can kind of select uh, militia groups to kind of support or join or participate in, um, and the range of interests that these groups represent. 
And in typical kind of academic work, the implication is that these groups represent marginalized people or those who are kept outside of the, um, the governance realm. But I actually think that these groups often represent people who are very well represented within the governance realm and, in fact, are looking for ways to alter or to change or usurp power in some ways. So one very simple suggestion would be that if you have been involved in some sort of militia organization that you should not be allowed then hold political office afterwards, which of course brings up all sorts of issues. But um, it, would, it would limit the benefit of violence within these societies where in fact groups are reacting more to each other than they are to governance or e the economy or anything else. Um, especially in Congo now we see over 20 groups and they are simply reacting to each other. I don't think that there's a good case to be made that they're reacting to outside external, even governance mandates. I, I'm going to jump in, but I, I think um, um, that Reiko should really jump in here as well um, in terms of dealing with uh, militia groups. But let me just jump in on two points. Um, one, to build off of the last point that was made, if you look at M23 right now, you know, to treat them as a non-political militia group is, would be a mistake. It's all about politics. And their latest proposal is for a semi-autonomous uh, control over their region and federalist control over their resources. So there is a huge component of trying to grab political power from the center um, with M23. Uh, part, in, I also heard how do you deal between, with your other counterparts, state and defense, in dealing with civil military relations. And I know I've worked at state and defense, um, and it's a huge culture difference there. And what I learned when I was at DOD is DOD's fine with everything as long as somebody else spends their money, i.e., if state uses its own money, DOD's fine. Don't try to use DOD's money. <laughs> that's, that's part of the challenge, right? Um, and so I think um, and it's fair enough. I mean, um, I, I, although they have more than anybody, uh, but you know, <laughs> I think you know, you know, the, the it, everyone loves the IMET programs for civil military. You know, working with Naval Postgraduate School and other type, um, you know, uh, groups is very helpful in doing the civil military training. I've been part of that type of training um, in places like Malawi and Ghana and other places, and I think bringing that type of programming, DoD would support um, because it's states' money. Um, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't be against it. But I also think working very closely with the defense attache um, in country is going to be key to trying to get the, uh, the programming right. You know, the, the working with the, the embassy team as a whole, um, the, the country team as a whole, um, is going to be important. But, you know, I really do believe that this type of programming, dealing with the demobilization process and how do you reintegrate or integrate, you know, uh, former soldiers into civilian life or even back as yes, constructive uh, forces disciplined um, who respect civilian control and human rights into the military is, is has was not given sufficient attention in 2009 and is why we are now in 2013 with an M23 rebellion. Can we have uh, Reiko? Is she on the line? Great. Go ahead. Yes, yes, thank you. Well, the question about how to engage practically uh, with these non-state actors, um, call them rebel groups, tell them, call them t terrorist organizations. Is is a really tough one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the delay here. Um, but if, yes, of course, you must work within uh, the rules on the ground. Um, oftentimes, to access um, any conflict-ridden uh, territories, you must get government access. But um, uh, I think uh, one and number one is the the point that, that I made in my talk, which is choose your partner. If it's uh, not possible to collaborate, it's not possible to collaborate. Uh, and also number two, choose the timing. Uh, it is often very difficult to uh, um, have a development intervention in a conflict zone. My focus uh, in my research has been 
in a context where the conflict is winding down or where negotiations are ongoing, so that access is um, uh, uh, is easy uh, more easily granted by the state. Um, and so if you're talking about state intervention, yes, of course you must work within the, the, the rules and get government access. Um, but so uh, one approach is to use um, uh, non-state organizations for interventions. And I, I believe that the next panel will actually be uh, speaking more on this point through uh, Professor uh, Joe's presentation. Um, so I would leave that to, to, uh, to hear and uh, to elaborate on more. Um, but in terms of the timing of the intervention, if intervention during conflict is not possible, then I believe that the timing uh, when negotiations are, negotiations are ongoing um, is uh, more of an opportune moment. Um, I studied a little bit uh, about the Nepalese conflict. I've done some field research there. Uh, the Maoists of Nepal were uh, deemed uh, to be a terrorist organization by many governments, but uh, because by institutional design they were brought into uh, the new uh, post-war uh, government, um, state and non-state uh, international actors had an opportunity to work with them uh, at the state level through uh, peace talks. Um, and through peace talks, uh, uh, they were able to sort of offer um, carrots for participation uh, and also negotiate access to their territories. Uh, what ended up happening is that they agreed to basically uh, dismantle all of their own governance institutions that they had established during the war um, uh, in return for joining the new government. Um, and so, um, I mean, I think practically speaking, in terms of this program um, that uh, we'll be implementing in conflict areas, I think we'll be looking more uh, at um, areas where the conflict is winding down or in immediate post-conflict areas. Um, so... And those are more opportune moments where negotiations and access are more easily granted. So I would focus on, on those areas and, uh, and those uh, moments in terms of timing. Okay, great, thank you. Um, other comments from the panelists here on some of the other questions? <clears throat> to, to Tristanara's point, um, I think absolutely it's vitally important to look at the security sector and perhaps move beyond, you know, there's some of the practices have now turned into sort of technologies that the DDR has applied or SSR has applied, and I'm not sure it's always appropriate to the context. So again, looking at the strategic sequencing of when, what type of demobilization, if we've seen so many times when um, militias have been demobilized only, see, only to see them remobilize in other, other forms or to, to need to, to grow the, 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 the national army in some way. Um, so I do think that there need to be smarter ways both to address the question of in independent militias <clears throat> and to ensure that the, the formation, that the strategy for the security sector adapts as, as circumstances change. And I think one question, particularly for the USAID community, <clears throat> is under what circumstances is it appropriate where you have put, you know, a very large army, like the SPLM in South Sudan, is it appropriate to have some kind of national service or to use military formations for some kind of reconstruction work, so building bridges, building roads? You know, it, when is that desirable? Um, to the question on the National Solidarity Program, there's actually a database of all the projects. So this may be a, a gold mine for um, academics and researchers who want to look into this question further. Just I'll briefly give some, some broad brush. I think you know, overall, what the communities have chosen to, to use the funds to do actually represents probably on a portfolio basis pretty similar to the national picture. And it's the, the six basic, it's, it's agriculture, culvert repairs, it's water and sanitation, it's pa very simple power, micro and and, um, you know, generate even these little diesel generators, um, road, farm to market and rural roads, health and education. Um, what's interesting, though, in, in, in a specific context, it's often very different from what the, N the local NGOs um, have on offer in a particular context. So you hear story after story of the villagers saying, you know, an NGO coming to a village saying, we're going to build you a well, and the villagers saying, please don't build us another well. Our water tables run dry. <laughs> in fact, what we need is X. So it's actually the flexibility that they have to tailor it exactly to their needs is where I think the strengths lie. A couple of other 
um, elements of it. Um, one of the things that's been happening is groups of villagers have been sort of spontaneously federating with each other. So 32 villagers got together to build a maternity hospital, 187 got to, together to do watershed management. So it's again, it's that flexibility to work at scale. And then there's a national level, a convention, national convention of communities where all the communities come together. And in these national discussions, I think what, what, what occurs to people is even though that they're separated by different geography and, and ethnicity, they have the same problems in different parts of the country. Um, one change that the villagers did want is they said, instead of having to spend out our grant before we get another one, they said, this is crazy. Why can't we put the money to work for us? And what they wanted was a revolving fund. Um, but those are some elements. But it's all, um, I think, publicly available in a, in a database. Any other comments about those questions? I think we can sneak in one quick question, and then we will uh, we'll wrap up. So we'll go over there. My name's John Becker. I was wondering for the panel, could you comment on gender violence as a driver of conflict? In particular, gender, I, I think you were very much involved with the Women's Justice and Empowerment Initiative. Um, and it looked at four, and it was through the Department of Justice. And the question is, is there, with regard to conflict and this, this commonality of violence, if you're beginning to look at gender violence and you're changing that mindset, is that a strategic investment to address some of the conflict or prevent the conflict sort of thing? I would, I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer, but I'd also ask my, my you know, if there's data on that or, you know. Um, there's recently been a study by the Human Security um, <coughs> Council or the Human Security Network on gendered violence. And in fact, Congo was one of their case studies. Um, and they found it was quite a bit lower than people suspected, but I don't think that makes it less important mm -hmm. than, than what we were saying. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think that, um, you know, you're, you're basically saying, can we put into place certain interventions and programs around gender violence that can have a broader impact on peace building? And and I think that obviously, in how you design programs, you most certainly could. Um, one thing that I would specifically say on that front is, first of all, that the 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 issue of sexual violence is not. Um, is not solely about rape of women, um, especially in Eastern Congo. Many, many men have been raped as well. Um, and so it's about violence. Um, it's very much about uh, violence. And I think that, you know, one of the things that you can do, um, including with women, because obviously they're the most vulnerable or one of the most vulnerable um, uh, members of society, is to do the type of uh, civil military programming, right? I mean, there's all types of, of, of programming going on in Congo that you can build into um, on, you know, women and empowerment and, you know, even addressing sexual violence specifically and rehabilitating them into society. But I would also think between perpetrators and victims or potential perpetrators and victims, if not the specific perpetrators. And here I'm thinking about, you know, the the the... the amount of indiscipline within the National Army of Congo and trying to design civil military relations programs that include women and civil society leaders who are women um, in, you know, in engaging with military actors in these types of IMET programs. Right? And, you know, we've done it before around resource budgeting. We've done them around, you know, relationship between the military with the media. There are all of these very specific and focused type of IMET programs, and you can also do uh, programming around uh, 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 sexual violence um, and, and have, you know, empowered women sitting at the table face-to-face -face with generals, colonels, and captains and others um, to talk about, um, you know, changing the norms or changing the, you know, evolving practices, but also about designing specific interventions within the military it is, as military discipline um, to address this problem. Great. Thank you. Uh, we're at the end of the time uh, for this session, and I've got a couple of orders of business. 
Uh, first off, and importantly, uh, it's been a delight to be part of this conversation, to hear some of the great ideas that have been put on the table. It's the beginning of a conversation. We'll continue it this morning. But really, the first order of business, I hope everybody will join me in thanking our panelists.